everything today has been fantastic, but、um, what I'm going to talk to you about is going to be the lazy approach.、Um, so, food, exercise, community,、um, and a combination of all of those things. Fantastic, fantastic approach to what we all want, which is healthy longevity, long life, happiness. But my approach is going to be simplistic and lazy, because I don't want to do anything. I just want things to just work.、Um, and 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 so that's what this talk is going to be about. Everybody wants that. Well, probably not in Arizona, but wherever you want to be jumping around and not sitting in a hospice care facility. Everybody wants that. So health. Definitionally, is understood by everybody. But time, time, well, doesn't always do nice things. Mostly, doesn't do nice things. And when I'm giving my talk, it is pointed towards just one thing,、uh, which is looking at biological aging. And this is what time did to these four sisters over 41 years. The picture started in 1974. I think this is 1980, 81, and so on. But look at what time does. They're obviously happy.、Um, they have kinship. They have fellowship over all these years together. Some of you may have seen this before.、Um, but 41 years. I think the last picture is from 2015. And when I look at this, there are so many layers of complexity in these pictures. And I, for my research work, and for my work with BioViva, with the University of Oxford, have picked one of the complexities that are being shown in this picture. As they get older over these 41 years, you can see their faces change. You can see their smiles stay the same. Whoops, sorry.、Um, and you can see the difference between 1974 and 2015. But what? I mean, everybody knows that they look different. Everybody can see that. But what I want to fix, what what my colleagues are working on, what we are working on at Bioviva,、um, is to tackle. The lack of robustness that happens with time, the biological aging, the decaying of the body that happens over the time, and this is an old saying, and I like that a lot. But why does that lack of robustness or the the frailty that kicks in? What is that, and how does it drive disease? These are the top five killers. And you don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be an engineer to see that mortality rates from these four diseases that kill about 80% of people in developed countries. This data is from England and Wales, but the pattern exists almost to the dot in all other industrialized countries, the OECD countries, and are at or around the rate、uh, age of 45, the、uh, population mortality rate starts to become. Visible at a higher level. Before that, it seems to be accidents and suicides and other things that are bigger causes of mortality. So why does that happen? Why is aging linked with that? We find that in geroscience, that not only is aging linked with those diseases, but a whole host of processes that are associated with this detrimental effect.、Um, That happens in biological,、um, in in your biology and your physiology over time. These are just some of them that are named. And here, the geroscience hypothesis is: Can we modify aging? Is aging modifiable? And the answer absolutely is yes. The old paradigm is on the left side here, which is we have therapeutic, whatever be your treatment,、um, whether it be naturopathic or Uh, pharmaceutical, whatever be your treatment, it is targeted towards、uh, the diseases that happen at the end. But if we can target the aging process, we may receive a significant、um, bang for the buck, so to speak.
Richard Miller did that analysis on a very small way, and he published this finding that you see here. And it simply states the average woman today lives about 81, the average of OECD countries, which is not true for Guernsey. It's about 86 here, so that's awesome already. If we cured cancer at a population level, how many years would be at? And according to his calculations, it would be about two, because they would immediately, the population on an average would fall prey to heart disease or diabetes or cancer, uh, I mean, or stroke and other issues. If you cured heart disease, you would get about four additional years of mean life expectancy. If you cured cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes altogether, all of those, you get about 16 years. But if you ameliorated even a slight bit of the aging process, if you rejuvenated or even slowed down the aging process, you would get about 33 years of benefit in health span. And that is a pretty decent hypothesis coming from animal data and in combination with the epidemiological data in humans. So how do we do this? As any scientist will first tell you, anytime you begin a conversation to your chagrin and to stop that conversation, um, is how do you define a problem? What is aging? When I showed you the pictures of those four sisters, everybody here knows that the picture on the right was the picture from 2015, the picture on the left was the picture from 1974, but how do you define it? You would, many people here, may be shocked to believe, or to find out, that we don't have biomarkers of aging because of this chart. I know this chart is hard to read, but what it says simply is that as we grow older, to a certain extent, we have good biomarkers of what our biological age is. We can define it with certain markers. These could be metabolic markers, physiological markers, anatomical markers, um, any markers. Um, but as we start to reach middle age, because of people coming to these conferences and listening to all of the excellent speakers, they start to age slightly slowly. Whereas others who are not coming to these conferences and not doing the practices, <laughs> yeah, Mark, you might as well book the ticket <laughs> for next year. Uh, the, who are not, but, the, but the point is that around middle age is you can see the divergence that happens, not just among men and women. I know this picture shows a man and a woman, uh, but among people who do certain things, certain interventions, and who don't, who have the gift of coming from long-lived families or living in blue zones, uh, coming from long-lived families, um, who have the right kind of epigenetic alterations. All of those things kind of start to diverge, and that's where you see the red line, which is a drop in accuracy of all biomarkers that we know of today. Telomere length is a pretty decent biomarker. Again, starts to fail around that time. Metabolic, uh, combinatorial metabolic markers, we can talk about them in detail later, um, are pretty good, but again, start to not see that heterogeneity that happens around that time. And really, it starts to go downhill from there, and we really don't have any good biomarkers. That's when we need it the most. And so that is a very big challenge. The implementation of that challenge is seen here. We don't have good biomarkers, but we are still trying to treat diseases, and this is what happens. This is the result of that. At lab, at the end where I work, because I'm not a medical doctor, you have Well, right. Um, <laughs> we're back. So we have about five to 10,000 compounds at, at the lab end of, um, of things. And, you know, through, altogether through over 15 years of research and a billion or more dollars of investment into this pipeline, most drugs fail. Somewhere between 85 and 97% of drugs will fail by the time they reach phase two clinical trials. The 85 percent end of drugs are for diseases where we can tolerate significant amount of toxicity, kind of uh, diseases that are like cancer. The 97 or 99 percent end, where 99 or 97 percent are where we are not willing to tolerate toxicity, like medicine for um, relieving your headaches. And, and so that kind of defines it. It's not like the drugs in certain categories are better than others. 
And this is the problem: we don't have good models. I'm going to show you some solutions to the problem in the last six minutes that I have. This is something that you guys have heard about: that the terminology of personalized and precision medicine. This is kind of what we have been doing at Oxford, and what we are trying to implement through companies like BioViva and others. Um, a combinatorial approach of diagnostics, prognostics, personalized experimentation, or, and personalized treatment. Now, I'm going to go into them in a little more detail in just in a few more slides. Um, so, this is the approach that we need for precision and personalized medicine. We also need, for our current pipeline, an adaptive clinical trial. So today, what we do is take a pool of patients, randomly selected, and we put them in a drug trial. Give them a treatment, and voila! What happens is a few of them respond. Most of them don't respond. Some have detrimental effects, and that drug goes nowhere. That's the in vitro modeling. So we can do both modeling in the computer and modeling on a plate on your own cells that are that we have taken. That's the iPS cell, the induced pluripotent stem cells, which is the cells that we get from your skin. We can Grow them into becoming liver, into becoming pancreas, into becoming neurons, into becoming any of those things. Fast forward that and see what your own genetic background leads to, what kind of diseases it leads to, and then from that we can design personalized therapeutics for you. Today you see that being done in tumors in cancer. You sequence the tumor and you treat it with various drugs on the plate. See if it works. If it works, well, you give to the patient and try it out.、Um, we're getting better at it, but in the future, we shouldn't just do it for、um, once you have the tumor. We should try to do it preventively. We can treat, as I was saying, your iPS cells and see what will work for your type of mutations. What is coming 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line in your neurological cells, in your neuronal cells?、Um, And finally, when you want to prevent stuff altogether,、um, like the next speaker will talk about, we can test it, like allergy testing on human skin. So your own skin can be a platform for testing new novel therapies. This is beneficial for patients, certainly, because you have safe, personalized treatment. It is beneficial for investors because you don't have to invest billions.、Uh, if this pipeline gets going, we can actually do it for tens of millions, but not billions. So we'll cut probably cost by 100. And of course, for scientists, this is a much more interesting platform than have than than spend 15 to 20 years over one molecule that was selected by a group of bankers、uh, or management specialists. In a pharmaceutical company, because it 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 is what is known, and we have an option to scale this up, because all of this can be done in one floor, because cells don't take up that much room, computers don't take up that much room, and this is the model that we are trying to promote. We are working with governments to bring this model to realization. Parts of it have been done.、Uh, we need to combine those two, all of these parts. And for that, we really need collaboration across all of the spectrum. We need education. We need policy、uh, research. We need resources from the government. We need resources from NGOs. We need special interest groups working with us. And of course, we need to form a coalition. This is where people like Mark come in, who are major connectors, and and we need to all work together. And that's what we have been starting to do. I'm going to leave you with this last slide. And、um, while you watch this, I'm going to just quickly read a quote because it is required as an Oxonian to read Richard Dawkins's quotes.、Um, the、um, what you're seeing is a mouse, which has a overexpression of PepCK, also known as phosphatidyl. Uh, carboxylase kinase. That's not the relevant part. The relevant part is just look at how much it can run compared to a wild type mouse. I know the quality is less, but they're just two furballs. So keep looking at it while I read this. They did not die out, for they are 
past masters of the survival arts, but do not look for them floating loose in the sea. They gave up that cavalier freedom long ago. Now they swarm in huge colonies, safe inside gigantic lumbering robots, sealed off from the outside world, communicating with it by tortuous indirect routes, manipulating it by remote control. They are in you and me. They created us, body and mind, and their preservation is the ultimate rationale for our existence. They have come a long way, those replicators. Now they go by the name of genes, and we are their survival machines. We can change that, just like we did in this mouse. You manipulate that gene, and that mouse runs six kilometers. Six kilometers. It lives longer as well. It eats more and weighs less than its, than its counterpart. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to make everybody healthy by sitting on your ass. <laughs> Thank you very much.